So, well, good morning. Um, we welcome all of you, and we're glad to have all of you with us today and all of those who are joining us online. We will start with the announcements. So, oh, the weekly announcements. Um, women's Bible studies, Wednesday mornings, 10 a.m. here. If weather is poor, the meetings will be online. Thursday nights at 7, oh, Thursday night, 7 p.m. at the Kin. Check messages if weather is questionable. For more info, talk to Cheryl. Um, youth nights are Fridays, 7.30 to 10 at the Kin. Please RSVP with Rebecca. Um, women's silent retreat, February 2nd to 3rd. Last chance to sign up. So please speak to Cheryl today if you would like to attend. And lastly, the sanctuary course is studying is a study dealing with mental health and is a course for those both dealing with mental health as well as those who are journeying with someone who is dealing with mental health or someone who just wants to be better informed for everyone. Um, they will be meeting on February 9th here from 7 to 9. If you missed the first session, um, you are still able to join the next one. For more information, please talk to Sarah, who is over there. And now we have a couple more announcements from Cheryl. Good morning. I guess that slide's not super clear, but we have a new study that's starting February 7th from 7 to 8.30. Um, it is open to anyone 16 and up. So um, it's not a women's Bible study. It's a anybody's Bible study. Um, so it's going to be here. It's on... It's a video series put out by Focus on the Family on Discipleship, and we have a promo video, so check that out. <laughs> the story of the Bible took place 3,000 years before our time in a very different culture. So the more we know about that time and place, the clearer the teaching becomes. What difference does it make whether it's an oak tree, a maple tree, or a tamarisk tree? It makes a huge difference. When Jesus is asked a profound question, he often tells a story without explaining it. You know what that rabbi had just done? He had restored the honor of a family. You'll discover there's a constant reference to the culture, the geography, the literature, history, other places in the text. What does that context add to our understanding of the story itself? But John doesn't think that way. John is thinking connection, connection, connection. The more we understand of the biblical story and the biblical text in the setting where it took place originally, the more insight we have into the way they're presenting truth. A, uh, they call it four season. So this is just the first one. It's 10 sessions. Uh, the videos uh, are, I'm, I'm trying to remember, they're maybe about 15 minutes in length. So not super long, but they're jam packed with a ton of really interesting information. And then there, there's a time of uh, discussion where there's a participant guide and, and it's got lots of questions and things to dig further into the topic. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, so we would love to have as many of you as are interested join us. And so just let me know if that's something that's interesting to you. If you need to take a week to pray about that, that's great. And you can get back to me and then, then I'll know how many participant guides to get. Um, so then uh, I have a, uh, there was an email that went out from Renee, but she asked that I read it in church too. She wanted to let you all know that she just really appreciates your support She's just not in a place yet where she's ready to come back to church. She'll be leaving this week to go to the U.S., and they'll be doing the funeral, and she's hoping once that is done and she's back in Canada that she'll have a bit of closure and be ready to be with a lot of people. So she says, Thank you to everyone who came to visit me, brought food, texted, called, and prayed for me and Patricia. Please continue to pray for us as we leave this Tuesday, January 23rd, to be with our family for Bridget's funeral on January 26th. 
Pray that God will give us strength when we empty her storage unit and go through all of her personal belongings. Pray for God, uh, sorry, pray that God will be there with love and comfort for my grandsons, Tyson and Trey. Only God can bring healing to our family in this difficult time. He is my strength, my refuge, and I will give him all my worries, and he will give me peace in my heart. I am so thankful for my church who cares for us. With much love, Renee. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're going to ask Tal to come on up. She has something to share with us for uh, a call to worship. I'm just going to pray with you. Father, we just thank you so much for Tal, and we thank you for her willingness to share what's on her heart. Um, God, we just ask for calmness and we thank you for this opportunity for her to uh, represent you as a young person who serves and loves and desires to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to get it out of the way and say I'm afraid of public speaking, but not necessarily afraid. I think I might have an intolerance to it. So if you could forgive me for losing my place or... Um, stuttering or whatever. <laughs> I have a reading from Exodus 4, verses 10 to 12, but first let me set the stage and give you some context to the situation. Our main character is Moses. He is tending a flock of sheep near God's mountain. When he notices a bush, it's on fire, it's burning, and so he goes to inspect it. It calls out to him from inside the bush. The voice tells him that it, is the, that it is God, the God of his ancestors, the God of Israel, and that he, is, that, that he has seen the suffering of his people and that he is sending Moses to save them, to take them out of slavery, to take them out of the land of Egypt. He provides Moses with answers to all of his many questions. And he even, um, and he shares the master plan, and he even gives him signs to show the people so that they will believe that God has sent him. Now you have a little bit of context. So I'm going to read Exodus 4, verses 10 to 12. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, for I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and my tongue <laughs> and of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will speak, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. I think so often we let ourselves be ruled by, by what we think we can or cannot do, what we're not good at, that somebody else could do it better than me. Please send somebody else. <laughs> um, but God said that he will go with us, he will help us, and he will send, um, and he will teach us what to do, how to say it, so I'm just going to pray with us right now. Oh, God, thank you that you are with us. You're not sending us alone. You have equipped us for the task you have for us. Forgive us for, letting, for leaning on our own understanding and teach us to rise up to, to what you are calling us to. Amen. We invite you all to stand. The gift of praise is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange. 
Is it on? We're going to dismiss the kids. PBJFs are asked to stay since most of you are helping with the service today.
morning. Um, so I'm now going to say the prayer requests. First, please continue to pray for Renee and Pat and their family as they continue to grieve their loss for Bridget. Brett has a nuclear test on her heart on Tuesday. Please pray for answers and the doctors. Also, pray for all high school students studying the, for the end of term exams and projects and any other unsaid prayers. Okay, I'm going to pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your love and your grace and your so many blessings. Lord, I thank you for your house that we get to come and we get to worship you. I pray that you just have Bridget in your hand, Lord, and I pray for Renee and Pat and their families as they continue to grieve. Lord, I pray for all the high school students going through hard times, the stress and the worry. It, I pray that you give them peace just that doesn't make sense, surpassing all understanding, God, and just heal them through, and get them through this time. I pray for Brett as she's going in for a test this Tuesday. I pray that you give the doctors an extra ounce of sleep that night. I pray that they be extra ready for the day and extra ready to take care of her and make sure that everything is taken care of. God, I pray for all of those unsaid prayer requests that you know that you have in your heart. Lord, I pray for all physical illness that in your name, it just disappear, it's gone. I pray for all mental illness, people struggling and battling every day. I pray that it be gone in your name. I pray that you help give people the courage to ask for help if they need help. And just help us this day and enjoy this day of rest. In your name, amen. Thank you, Axana. I think we have a little prayer warrior on our hands here, right? Um, so the next thing that we're going to present, we're going to have a mission moment. Um, some of you guys may or may not know that Scotia has uh, traveled across Canada, and she's uh, in BC. Um, I just wanted to throw out some facts to you about some of the things that she's actually experiencing firsthand. 20% of Canada's homeless population consists of young people between the ages of 13 and 24. At least 6,000 young people experience homelessness every night. 40% of homeless youth first experience homelessness before the age of 16. Over 50% of homeless youth indicated that abuse at home contributed to their homelessness. And it often leads to addictions of drug and alcohol, um, sex, and many other things that they struggle with. So um, Life Teams is uh, a partnership program with YFC Youth Unlimited out west, um, affiliated to the Vancouver branch. And Scotia felt really called to the program that they offer um, to be experiencing these types of hardships and dealing with uh, high risk and at risk youth. Um, so she can't be here because she's there. So she decided to send a video um, to you guys just to give a little update. Hi church family, it's Scotia here. Thanks for taking a few minutes to hear about my missions out here in BC. So if you aren't aware, I've been enrolled in a program called Life Teams, a school for youth outreach since this past September. We are a program partnered with YFC Youth Unlimited. We focus on connecting with marginalized and vulnerable youth to build relationship and to show God's love throughout their life. So let me tell you how I've been representing Jesus in this ministry. Though I could touch on many topics, I will share what God has put most on my heart. I want to share one journey of a youth that God has invited me to walk alongside with through this season. Since the fall, I've had the honor of hearing from Switchy, a grade 12 high school student that I work with twice a week. She's a determined artist and very confident in what she believes. I felt God telling me to truly listen to her and to invest in her more at the school. 
talking more with her, it was hard hearing the harshness of her world and the lack of love that she receives from people close to her. I could see that it had hardened her from being gentle and kind to others in her friendships. It wasn't until before Christmas break that she had opened up saying that she actually knew Jesus, but was really hesitant to know more about him. She worries mostly that her friends and family would point fingers at her and discourage her from knowing more about this loving God that she's heard so much about. So as I continue to journey with her, I just ask that you please pray for God's love to shine in her life and that she knows that she is truly loved and there is so much grace for her. And this is only one of the many youth that I've gotten to know through the high school. Many of the students that I've spoken with have told me that they experience hard lives and hard circumstances dealing with drug and alcohol addictions as well as even homelessness. I'm truly thankful that God has given me a soft heart to really listen to them, to hear their hurt, and to show them that even through tough things, God is for them and not against them. So moving forward, we have a missions trip where grade 11s from Saskatchewan are staying with us for a week. We will be taking them to different places in the area to serve, including food banks and local shelters. We pray that these students come with an open mind and an open heart. So please pray for this experience for them. What's great about being at Life Teams is that I have the opportunity to partner with people who are able to support me financially and prayerfully through this. So if you feel led to support me through prayer, there are cards that my wonderful mother, Rebecca, uh, will be handing out to anyone who wants one. This card can serve as a reminder of what God is doing through me in my community in BC. If you also feel encouraged to support me financially, this second semester uh, costs $5,000 for me to be here, so I am raising it as I am here. I know that God will provide, and so I trust him in this process. Any of your support is such a blessing to me and the work that God has set me on here in this community. Thanks again, and I'm so grateful for your thoughts and prayers. Uh, I just wanted to add to that as a mom, listening to some of the stories that she has shared. Um, there was one experience that uh, she called home and I was in tears um, for 24 hours. <clears throat> They drop them off downtown Vancouver, and I don't know how many of you have been downtown Vancouver. Um, I went with her in September to uh, drop her off at this program, and I had a hard time leaving her there. Um, when you drive down the streets in Vancouver, you think there's a lot of homelessness, you've heard that, um, but you're not prepared. Um, you expect to see these things in third world countries, um, not in Canada. When you're driving down the main street, um, there's no sidewalk. You can't see sidewalk for tents, for people. Um, there's people uh, doing drugs right on the street, and you have to be careful when you're driving because often they don't know where they are, and so they can just jump right out in front of you. And so you have to be very, very careful. Um, I thought, well, this was the main street. Well, I turned the corner, and the next street was the same, and the next street was the same, and I couldn't believe that it wasn't just a street or an area, it was all over the city. Um, so I just would ask that you would pray for her. Um, she spent 24 hours, they dropped them off, and she had to live and survive um, as a homeless youth. And they gave them nothing. And the stories that she came back with and the people that she had connected with, it reminds me that it could be any one of us going through something really difficult and with many different choices and decisions and circumstances end up in that same predicament. And um, it was just an eye opener. So I just thank you for your prayers, mostly as a mom part. If you could just be praying for her, that would be amazing. 
Also, these are the cards. I'll have them with me. I actually have to leave a little early, so I'm going to hand them to Jerry. So if you would like uh, to stick this on your fridge to think about her and pray for her, uh, you can get them from Jerry. Okay. All right. I am now going to ask Chin to come on up. She has chosen a psalm to read for us today, and she's going to share a little bit. Psalms 139, for the director of music of David, a song. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's room. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, you saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book, before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count, were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I love Psalms 139 because it is a beautiful reminder of the relationship between us and God. It shows how he knows us our every step and every move. It shows how he knows us inside and out. It reminds us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It is a reassuring and comforting passage that reminds us of God's presence and love in our lives. Thank you. All right, I'm going to also, uh, thank you, Chen. I'm going to ask Aksana to come and share something with us. All right, I am now going to, whoa, sorry. I'm now going to read the poem, The Starfish Story, adapted from The Star Thrower by Lauren Ainsley. Once upon a time, there was a wise man who used to go to, to the ocean to do his writing. He had a habit of walking on the beach before he began his work. One day, as he was walking along the shore, he looked down the beach and saw a human figure moving like a dancer. He smiled to himself at the thought of someone who would dance to the day, and so he walked faster to catch up. As he got closer, he noticed that the figure was that of a young man, and that what he was doing was not dancing at all. The young man was reaching down to the shore, picking up small objects and throwing them into the ocean. He came closer still and called out, Good morning. May I ask what it is you, that you are doing? The young man paused, looked up, and replied, Throwing starfish into the ocean. I must ask then, why are you throwing starfish into the ocean? Asked the somewhat startled young man, or sorry, wise man. To this the young man replied, the sun is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them in, they'll die. 
Upon hearing this, the wise man commented, But young man, do you realize that there are miles and miles of beach, and there are starfish along every mile? You can't possibly make a difference. At this, the young man bent down, picked up yet another starfish, and threw it into the ocean. As it met the water, he said, it made a difference for that one. This poem is a lot like being a Christian teen. Everywhere around you, there are dying starfish, people that feel lost, broken, and don't know the Lord to save their lives. It can feel very discouraging to want to make a difference and not know where to start. But this poem is an encouragement to start one friend at a time and introduce them to the light that is the Holy Spirit, who can completely change your life by simply admitting that we are nothing and God is everything. So even if I only make a difference for one person, that's one life that has been saved. And to me, that's got to mean something. Prayer is such a gift. As Mr. Willock says, it is a privilege and an honor to pray. So let's do it together. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are in our hearts and you know everything. You know us each indi individually and you know us from the second you put us in our mother's wombs. I thank you for our hearts wanting to make a difference and help other people. I pray that you help us to do that. And like Scotia said, just listen to them and really hear them. Have our hearts be softened to just listen and do whatever we can to make a difference. Because in the long shot, it's heaven that we want crowded, not earth. So I pray that you help us and help people that don't know the Lord and who are struggling to believe it. I pray that you just help everything, every single one of us, to make a difference as much as we can through you. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. These young people inspire me. Um, all right, I'm going to ask Silas to come on up, and he's going to share his favorite scripture and why it's his favorite. Hi, my name is Silas. For those of you who don't know me, today I'll be sharing a verse that's special to me. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6 to 7. The verse says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. I love how in this verse, they put the emphasis on truth, protect, trust, hope, and persevere because it describes promises of God and God is love. He promises he is true, he will protect me, I can trust him, I can have hope, and he will not leave me. When I hear this, I always think, wow, I've got it good. Because the truth is, I do. And sometimes a verse like this one is one of those things you just need to hear when you're having a bad day. Very glad you've been up here, and God bless. All right, so we have had uh, quite a few of our youthies share, and I don't know if you guys are getting stiff in your seats, but we're going to get you to stand up because we have uh, some dancers that would like to lead us. This time we have sound, so it should be a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to ask Pillar and Chin and Chen to come on up. And we're going to do some church-appropriate dance moves. So I'm going to get everybody to stand up. You try the best you can. Give God all you've got. And we're going to do some dancing. Welcome to church. We got about five minutes before the service starts, so here are some church appropriate dance moves you can do whenever the spirit moves you. So get on up and let's sweat to some scriptures. Or maybe not, or just, just let's go. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Make sure it's on the face. See it on the face. Yeah. Bring it together. Here we go. Let it go. You take the stone, you let it go. You're unhindered by armor. Let that elbow sway. Elbow, 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 elbow. Okay. 
one of my personal favorites. Resurrection. You gotta get down to get back. Yeah. Keep working, you guys. Keep working. You're doing great. I'm doing great. I'm getting a little tired. We gotta stomp hard, stomp hard, stomp hard. You're crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. Yeah. Okay. Good break there, good break. Good job, guys. Here we go, ready? Get that, get that whip going. Scare those tax collectors, those merchants. Merchants. Make sure you look afraid. Yeah. This is salt. You look back and salt, salt, salt. I'm getting to you. You're doing great, everybody. I'm oh, almost. Okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Two minutes, 30 seconds left. Here we go. Close the end. One, two, three, four. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. You got his blessing. Two minutes left. Just a little under. Go for the bucket. No! I'm not gonna puke. Okay. Sharp the knife. Ride the horse up the mountain with the knife. Get your boy in the back. Hoist it up. No! Hoist it up. Abraham, no! Hoist it up. Abraham, no! One out of 30 guys. We can do this. Okay, this one's important. The meekness is important. All right, one minute, guys. We're doing great. Keep it meek. But then watch this. This is not meek. Coming at the end. Swords! Swords! Come down here, baby! Flame them dead! Flame them dead! Flame them dead! Whoo! Whoo! Yeah, there! You can do it! There's something important to you! We're sowing the seeds! Here we go! Sow it! Make sure you hit that! Turn around! Stay away from that! Watch your back. No, God's got it for you. Watch your back. No, God's got it for you. I know much more I can do this. You're gonna have to take it for me. On the last push, literally. Samson, what are you doing? Push. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to start. Let's just start the service. wanted for you guys to burn off some energy and we're going to listen to the message now that we've gotten some of the energy out so marcus they're all yours they're warmed up for you okay so can everyone hear me nice okay well good morning everyone um so yeah so today is the youth service so um when i was asked to preach i knew i wanted to do something that was kind of like relevant um to the youth of today so I uh, chose conformity. Um, so firstly, I kind of want to establish like what I'm talking about, even though we all pretty much kind of know what conformity is. Um, 
this isn't the definition, like the official definition, but it's pretty much just um, con uh, compromising or matching the behaviors and beliefs of other people um, because of pressure, and that could be social or cultural. Um, so I have some examples. Uh, there's some, um, you know, kind of beneficial or harmless ones, like staying quiet in a library and like wearing normal clothes. But then there's also some negative examples too, like peer pressure and, um, you know, political agenda and propaganda and how that can influence us. Um, but it's pretty much just like uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So um, personally, as a young believer, I feel like conformity is um, at the root of a lot of problems that we face today. And this isn't strictly limited to young people either, because all age groups uh, experience this. Uh, so for this sermon, I'm going to be talking about two environments that young believers will find themselves in. Uh, the Christian environment, which is kind of anywhere there is a majority presence of believers. So church, youth group, and family, if your family are believers. Uh, but we also have the secular environment too, which would be the public schools and your workplace. Um, so I'll start with the easier one. Oh, sorry, it's kind of small, but don't worry, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, it's a bit more obvious, but it, I'll start with the secular world. So the Bible provides us with a lot of examples about um, like not conforming to the world, a lot of verses about that. Uh, but while reading, I, I did feel like Daniel was the perfect example of this. Um, so if you don't know the context, I can explain. Basically, Daniel takes place in the year 605 BC. Uh, it's when um, the empire of Babylon is invading uh, the kingdom of Judah. Um, so yeah, here we have, um, if you want to read along, it's Daniel 1, 3 to 7. So then the king, that is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the kings, that king is the, the king of Judah, descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs, which is Ashpenaz, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why, uh, yeah, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? then you would endanger my head before the king. So in this passage, Daniel and his friends are around the age of 15 to 20. So they are quite young. They're taken from their home, and their godly Hebrew names are changed for names that are commemorating um, pagan deities. Um, and their bodies are also permanently um, altered, and they're educated in a foreign nation with the purpose of serving a foreign king. So there's a lot of pressure in that situation, clearly, but the imminent pressure that this verse is talking about is the food and wine that they are being given. Uh, very likely, this food wasn't kosher, and that's because it was the leftovers from sacrifices. So to eat, it would be partaking in pagan worship. Um, Daniel, he's determined to not do that, and later we're actually told that um, him, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah they all join in on this request not to eat the food. But remember, all of the others partook, so most of them gave in to this pressure. Um, I also want you to notice that there's no explicit threat of death at this time for Daniel, uh, for not conforming at this point. Um, so I would say that this passage is quite similar to what youth would experience today. 
I also want to call attention, I bolded it, but I don't think you can see that, but uh, Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, is actually a, a very friendly person, right? He's, he's not mad when Daniel comes to him to ask for like some accommodations, and his reaction is actually kind of the opposite. It's, it's along the lines of like, sorry, but I, I could be killed for not taking care of you good enough. You know, like, I can't allow you to like harm yourself. So he's a very, very considerate person, and, and the Bible even says that God has put favor of Daniel in Ashpenaz's heart. So that's, that's important, because whenever we think of people attacking the Bible or questioning God's character, well, not questioning, but attacking God's character, we often have this um, idea that they'll be very hateful, angry, you know, they'll be screaming at you. Um, but just like Ashpenaz, uh, a lot of the time, the pressures don't actually come from a place that is um, that we are wary of. They'll come in a more subtle and friendly way. So um, I have two examples of some pressures, which are mostly just arguments that I've um, personally experienced. Um, I'll give you the responses uh, after I say them of, to both of them, so I'm not leaving you like with unanswered questions. But I want you to put yourself in the position of a young person who you know, doesn't have a lot of knowledge on this topic, first hearing this from uh, these people. So the first I actually heard from my Muslim friend in uh, university. He's a very knowledgeable, kind, and honest guy, so kind of like Ashpanaz, you know, someone who uh, is not aggressive or angry. So uh, when speaking with him about violence in the Quran, uh, he explained the context in which those verses were written. So at the time, uh, the Muslims were being attacked by the foreign nations, and the call to violence is that I'm sure most people are aware of. They were actually calls for defense to take arms to protect themselves against the attackers. Uh, my friend compared it to when actually the God of the Bible calls for the destruction of like the Hittites, Amorites, and you know all those people groups. Um, and I was familiar with those biblical verses, and I was also familiar with their contexts. Um, so to hear this argument being used to defend something else uh, was kind of shocking for me because I had never, like, I can't really destroy this logic because it is logic I myself am employing. Um, the second argument was from someone um, in the LGBT community. Uh, she's also a Christian. Obviously, I have disagreements uh, with certain parts of her theology. But she's a very normal, kind, and level-headed person. Basically, uh, what her argument was pretty much about was Leviticus 20.13. The word in the NIV translation, the word man actually appears twice. Uh, the New King James Version, which is the version I have, uh, it doesn't do this. It has man and then male. And that's not an accident because in the original Hebrew, those two words are not the same. The first one is zakar, which has the connotation of being an adult man, while the second is ish, which does not have this uh, qualification of being an adult. So the, her claim was that um, through a modern biased interpretation, the true meaning, which is pedophilia, has been replaced. And uh, it's, it's very inconsistent with the historical context this passage was written in. So now I'll give you the responses so you know that there are answers to these questions. I'll start with the, uh, the Muslim apologetics one. So, Firstly, the Bible and Quran are, are very different texts, um, both like literary, structurally, and for purpose. Um, the Bible is not always intended to be prescriptive. So we think of King David, right? He's called a man after God's own heart. But we're all very much aware that we're not to follow his, his example of adultery and murder. So clearly, the Bible is not telling you to act in that way. Whereas in the Quran, it doesn't have this sort of distinction to say that the calls to violence in the Quran, which are in the final chapters, to say that they're isolated incidents is, is very blind to the history of Islam and the, the Muhammad's own life as well, as a warlord. So I'll, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, according to Islamic theology, later chapters in the holy book succeed previous ones. It's called abrogation. So if there's any contradictions, you always go with the uh, most recent revelation. And Surah 9, which is the final chapter of the Quran, that's, where, that's the, the chapter that has a lot of the, um, the violent 
passages that you might be aware of. Um, so classical Muslim theologians have always interpreted this to mean that these do take precedence over the earlier peaceful passages. And not only that, but clearly Muhammad and Muhammad's closest followers after he died, um, if you look at what they did, they very much took um, the final commands as prescriptive, uh, which include a lot of like very graphic details, but also like forced conversions, for example. Now with the issue in Leviticus, um, so the interpretation that it's limited to pedophilia uh, is, is a, a biased interpretation. Um, firstly, you have to compare scripture with scripture, which this argument does not do. But even if you do take this out of context, which you shouldn't do, but even if you do, the very next passage states that um, they have both committed a detestable act. And if this was indeed child abuse, um, it, it would imply that the child is at fault, which is obviously not accurate and not consistent with the rest of the Bible. So obviously, um, this argument was kind of made in a microcosm, taking apart specific areas where she wanted to. But, um, but these arguments, they, they seemed compelling at first, you know, because I, I, I don't know Hebrew, I didn't know the, the Quran's historical context. Um, but the reason why they are so strong is because of our own ignorance, our lack of knowledge, and our lack of understanding. It's not because these are silver bullets that are actually, uh, you know, have sound evidence. And um, I also want to call the attention to the fact that these conversations were all very amiable, and I do consider all these people friends. Um, but yet our worldviews do disagree fundamentally. So back to Daniel, um, he was friendly with Ashpenaz as well, like I am with these people. Um, at first, the pressure to conform it wasn't a, a fiery furnace, which it later would become, and it would become life-threatening. Um, it, was, it was gentle, it was subtle, and it was convincing. Because remember, all but four defiled themselves with the food. So um, as a young person, um, not just me, but I feel like all of us, we have this idea that we will know the answers when uh, we're confronted with these things, um, that we'll be able to like, keep a cool head and defend our faith properly. But um, a lot of the times we don't realize that these people that are attacking our faith, they're not just rambling and they do have arguments that are thought out and they will take you by surprise at how compelling they seem. Um, so one way to help with this issue is, of course, uh, to be in the Christian environment, which I'll, I'll talk about now. So basically, like when you surround yourself with fellow believers, um, you're far likelier to find an answer to these issues. Um, chances are there's someone in the congregation who will know the answer or at the very least, they'll, they'll know where to kind of point you to find an answer, like if it's a, an online resource that you know of. So obviously, that's why finding a congregation is very important, because we can help each other learn, and we can build each other up in our understanding. But we also conform when we're in a Christian environment as well. And in a lot of ways, uh, this type of conformity is uh, much subtler, because we don't ever expect this to be a negative thing. So like when you're surrounded by believers, um, it's very easy to say the right things, right? You just kind of have to look at what your parents are doing, and then you, you learn how to pray, you participate in communion, baptism, you just you match everyone's theology pretty much. It's very easy to just go with the flow. Uh, Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So learning about our faith is, is a, a very good thing, and it's something that parents should do for the benefit of their child. But young believers, we have the responsibility of being careful. Um, when you're, in a, when you're like in a setting that is very Bible positive or pro-Christian, as church hopefully is, it's very easy to just join in on that. But if you're only conforming to your environment, as soon as you're put into the secular world, um, it's going to be like a cover being pulled from under you. Um, you. You can't be kept in the safety of the church your whole life. Like You will have to go out and discern for yourself. And if you haven't equipped yourself, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because there's going to be a lot of stumbling blocks that you just aren't prepared for. 
So I'll kind of end with this like topic about you know how how can we prepare ourselves? You know, like how can we, what can we do as youth and as parents to youth? Um, and to that, just look for the Bible. First uh, Peter three fourteen to fifteen says, "But even if you do, uh, even if you sh- uh, should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed." And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. That's important. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. It's also important. With meekness and fear, have a good conscience, so that they, when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than it is for doing evil. So that's exactly it, right? We have to equip ourselves with the knowledge and be prepared to give a defense for why we believe what we believe. Um, And the second part kind of deals with, you know, how you're supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to do it with love, which is important because um, truth without love will only harm someone. Uh, It'll push them away further than they already are. And um, if, you're, if you're using truth without love as a weapon to win an argument, you're doing it wrong. And so, I mean, I guess this, you might be wondering, like, you know, how do we, how do we get this knowledge? How, how do I know how to defend against topics I will never see coming, you know? And the answer to that is quite simple. It's just read scripture, right? Uh, you know, ask questions and research them. Look into why we believe what we believe and why you believe what we believe. Look into why you can trust the Bible. Uh, Look at common criticisms of the Bible as well. Don't shy away from uncomfortable um, topics or uncomfortable comments. Look into them and be prepared because they will inevitably get used against you or against what you believe. Um, You won't be able to have all the answers. It's not not really possible because you're not like an encyclopedia and no one expects you to be, but Whenever you get confronted with a point or an argument that does take you back a little bit, um, you just look into it and learn, and then you will, uh, next time it's used against you, you'll you'll know what to say. Uh, Just like Daniel, just just copy Daniel, you know, stand firm in what you believe, and don't, you don't feel the need to compromise right away. Research it, pretty much. Um, And also, have faith that there are answers as well. Um, a lot of like modern debates kind of have this, um, it's very frustrating, but it's kind of this, this annoying back and forth argument after argument, and no one kind of accepts defeat until one person doesn't know the answer, and then you, know, you can start gloating, and then I- I've heard this statement so many times, it's like Christians don't even know their own Bible. And so, um, and so just let that not be so, right? Know your Bible read it and learn what it says and what it means as well. And that's it for me. Thank you and have a good day. That's better. We're just gonna pray for uh, Marcus. God, thank you that we're able to gather in this place and have someone like Marcus come up with such great knowledge to teach us. And uh, Father, I would just ask a blessing upon him um, as he continues his his walk uh, towards you, Lord. And uh, thank you again for his uh, his knowledge on uh, on the Bible and teaching us today. So give him a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, just want to thank everybody for the service today, especially all the young people who did a great job. Um, singing, dancing, and uh, preaching. Um, yeah. Uh, before you go, if you are interested, I have a prayer card you can put on your fridge for Scotia. Uh, it's just great to look at when you get your milk in the morning for your coffee. It's uh, always a good reminder. Um, so I just want to say a prayer before you go, and I uh, hope you have a good week. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for Revive. Thank you for what you were doing in this community. Thank you that we're able to um, help our youth grow and uh, we continue to water them as they become adults in this community and uh, and give back. Thank you for everything you do for us and uh, give us all a blessing this week. 
and um, let's just remember that uh, we represent you, and hopefully we can do that well. in jesus name, amen.